Okay, so in this video, I'm going to show you how we can motion track a video and then use it to create a panoramic stabilization. In this case, we analyze the trajectory of an interceptor and we combine that with some analysis of rockets that were fired from inside Gaza. And we use that to build a case that contradicts the narrative of the state of Israel with regards to the attack on the Al-Akhli hospital on the 17th of October. And you can read more about that on the Forensic Architecture website. So to begin, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to the new workspace and I'm going to add a motion tracking workspace. And I'm going to go to this button here and I'm going to open up a video. This is a video from Gaza and I'm going to set the scene frames so that they match this clip. So this will set the range from 1 to 1300, which is the length of the clip. And I'm also going to press prefetch, which is going to load up the frames into memory memory so that when we scrub through we can easily see the footage. So in order to motion track this we need to pick some points and when you're picking points to track it's good to pick ones that are visible for a decent duration. It doesn't matter if they get blocked or occluded at some point but for generally working on the clip it's good to have ones that last for a while. So I'm just going to focus on the first 300 frames for now and as I scrub through I can see that this little light down here in the foreground looks like quite a promising tracking point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in here and I'm going to hold down control and I'm going to click on the image and you can see that that creates this marker object and this is a tracking point and what I can do is I can scale that up so if I press S you see it gets bigger and I'm just going to scale it up a little bit so that it accommodates the area around that point and then in order to track this I'm going to press the track forward button here and what this will do is it will go forward frame by frame and it will try to detect that feature across multiple frames. So you can see it was able to track it for 26 frames here. This little graph shows you the displacement on the Y and the X axis and you can see in here we've got this red and blue trail which shows the path of that in the past and in the future. So you can see that that got up to frame 25 and then it failed on frame 26. So I'm going to go to frame 26 and you can see here that the motion blur has stretched out that feature. So I'm just going to bring it back into the center and then I'm going to try tracking forward again and you can see this time we got to frame 37 and here I'm just pressing G to move the track back into the center. If you go to the track tab here you can see this little window which shows you the track that you're looking at at the moment and I'm going to reposition it there at frame 37 and then try tracking forward again and it seems to have failed again at 38. If you have footage that's blurry, that's shaky, you often find that this can be quite tedious but it's worth persevering and here again we've lost it at frame 41 and then again at frame 51 and here I'm just pressing G and I'm just adjusting and moving this tracking mark marker back into the center of this blurred object which represents the light. Here again we've lost it at 52. So this process can be quite painstaking but it's worth sticking with it and we're going to have to do this for at least two features and from my experiments on this clip three features works well and you'll also notice that there's this other button here which is to track forward by one frame and that's useful if you want to just go frame by frame the nice thing about about the other button here this one um, is that it will do as many frames as it can before it loses the tracking point i'm just going to keep going through here and as I scrub through the timeline, you can see that that trail is updating. And a very useful feature that we have is the lock to selected. So if I have this object selected and I press L, this little locked uh, indicator comes up here in the corner. And now the viewport will be locked to that particular point. So you can see that this tracking marker is always in the center of my screen. And then if you want to unlock it, you can press L again. But I find it's quite useful to have that locked in the view whilst I'm working on it. So this is the probably the most time consuming part of the whole process going through and tracking these little pixels. You want to choose a, a feature that is that is bright that has contrast with the rest of the scene and ideally a feature which is kind of consistent throughout. Often that means like picking a pattern on a surface and you want it to be a single point in space as well so you don't want it to be something that has any depth to it. You don't want to have objects that are overlapping or interfering with each other in parallax. You just want to have a single feature on a flat surface. But in this clip, the light serves that function quite nicely. So here we go, we're going up towards 300 frames now. So that's 300 frames of that point tracked. That's looking pretty good. So I'm going to go back to frame one and I'm going to try and find another feature. So when you're looking for features in the image, multiple features, ideally you want to have features that are as far apart from each other in the scene as possible because that means that you'll get the maximum spatial resolution when you come to stabilize the footage. So unfortunately, this watermark does block out a lot of these points on the horizon, which will make them hard to track but there is this area here down in the corner which is quite useful so I think this this little blob of light here could be quite helpful for us so I'm going to click on that control click again 
to add the tracking point to scale it up a little bit and then i'm just going to start tracking forwards and see how far we get so again you can see that it's failing a little bit frame 18 failing at frame 28 but i'm just guiding it back into position using g another shortcut that you can use is if you press alt and then use the arrow keys you can track forward frame by frame and that didn't work because it failed again but if i move it back a center maybe we can track some frames nope doesn't want to do it there we go so you can see i'm pressing alt and the right arrow key to track forward frames and that's the same as pressing this button here so i'm just going to keep going through keep adjusting and sometimes you'll get like a blur like this where it becomes completely out of control and you can look at the other point here you can see that the camera is moving vertically because we've got that vertical smudge and so i'm going to try and place this as best i can with these kinds of footage it's hard to get it to be perfect but you can get close we can see that there are these multiple ghosts of the same light which indicates that it might be some kind of high frequency source of illumination so i'm just going to keep moving that back into place and keep automatically tracking you can see down here in the position graph how far we are along this is our previous track in the faded color and then in the in the bright color you can see that the track that we're currently on so i'm just going to keep going through and these areas that show the high displacement those are the areas where there's lots of movement and where it's flat here you can see that there's not very much movement when you get a spike that normally indicates that there's some sudden jolt in the footage and then i think it's going to get a bit easier after this bit there we go. Yep. So we got beyond frame 300 there, which was my target. And it can be useful to um, do this in chunks because it can be a bit daunting sometimes to track an entire clip. So I can see in some places here, this tracking marker is going a little bit off the rails. Like here, for instance, it does this kind of funny wiggle. That might not matter too much, but you can see at this point, it's drifted to the right hand side of the feature. You can see between those two clips. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this one here and I'm going to recenter it. So this is the danger with the automatic tracking is that sometimes it can drift. Uh, Let's have a look and see how that did. Okay, that was a bit better there, I think. And if we track forward from there, let's see what we've got. Yeah, so I went a bit crazy here with the multiple. This was a bit problematic when the ghosts appeared. And here I'm just using the arrow keys to go frame by frame through the footage and cleaning up this very particular part. And then I think there again, it's drifted out a little bit. I'm just going to go frame by frame for a few frames just to check that it's... Oh yeah, it's drifting out again there. So you've got to pay quite close attention and make sure that the tracking marker doesn't stray there because it's straying outside of the feature. Because even very small differences in the detection of these features can have quite a big impact on the eventual stabilization. So yeah, it looks like it's back on track when it gets to that point there. And then that's a bit wobbly, but it's okay because it's quite blurry footage anyway. And then here we have a little bit of a wobble, but then it sort of gets back on course. So that track's looking quite good now, so I'm quite happy with that. And then for the final point, we need to find another feature, hopefully that's far away from these two, um, although we are a little bit constrained in terms of what we can use. Let's go for this light here down at the bottom of this building. So I'm going to control click again, scale it up a little bit, and then try to track forward automatically. Inevitably, the track will fail at some point, and then it's just a case of guiding it back when it fails. You might also find it's useful to use a tablet as the input method when you're doing this process because a tablet allows you to place the object very precisely using the pen. There we go, and we're up to 345. That one wasn't too bad. That was clearly a nice feature that we were working with. So for, for this clip, it doesn't matter if some, if some of the um, features get lost, like this one here is getting cut off the edge of the frame. That's okay, as long as we overlap the timeline with new features. So for instance, as this one goes off the edge of the frame here, you might start tracking this light on the top of this building, for example, or perhaps these windows here. So as long as there are at least two or three features being tracked consistently, three probably to be safe, somewhere on the image then you'll be able to carry out this process for the entire duration of the clip i'm only going to go up to this frame here for now because i want to be able to show you the rest of the process so now that we've got those three points tracked and we're happy with the stability of those points we can go over here to the solve tab and for all intents and purposes this is a tripod shot so i'm going to enable the tripod setting here this basically means that we're dealing with a nodal pan which means that there's a single point that the camera is moving around obviously in reality the camera was moving a little bit more than that but because we're only dealing with the mid ground and the, the background we're effectively looking at a tripod scene and i'm going to check these buttons here refine focal length optical center radial distortion and that will adjust the image slightly to accommodate for the various aberrations caused by the optics of the camera and then I'm going to press solve camera motion and you should see that there's a solve error that comes up here in the corner 
1.11 pixels in this case, which is okay, it's not ideal, but it's good enough. Um, that level of error will change over the course of the clip as these features deviate from each other, and it's indicated by this blue line that you can see. So if you have a big spike in the blue, it normally means that there's a big error. And actually I can see here that this spike in error is probably being caused by this feature here, which is jumping very suddenly across the uh, pixel. So what we could, we could actually, we could actually go in and fix that. The nice thing about this process is that you can go back and you can tweak some of the settings and it's very easy to update the camera solve. Yeah, so it looks like I missed this bit here where this was sort of spreading out. I mean this, yeah, the, the blue line on the chart here can be a good way to kind of debug process. Let's go through some of those. So that looks a little bit better. So I'm going to press solve again and you can see that the error went down slightly. So there is a, there is a, um, a method by which you can sort of like gradually improve the tracking of this object. So there we go. We've got like something that we're reasonably happy with and it's okay if we need to go back again afterwards. So I'm going to scroll down here inside the solve tab and I'm going to press this button here, set as background. It's going to set the background image in the camera and I'm going to set up a tracking scene. That's going to apply the tracking modifier to the camera. Now you can see that if we move through the timeline cameras moving a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select the camera object, which is the frame around here, go to the camera settings and in background image, I'm going to put the image in the front and I'm going to set this to crop. And I'm also going to turn up the opacity slightly so we can see the video overlaid onto the 3D space. Now, if we move through, you can see that the uh, image is overlaid onto the 3D, but there seems to be a little bit of drift. And from experimenting with this, this is a bit of a bug. It's to do with the fact that we're using a portrait video. Blender's not very good at recognizing that it's portrait. And so, so what we need to do is go over here to the camera settings and it's basically using the wrong focal length and what we have to do is multiply the focal length by the ratio of the width and the height so i'm going to go into the focal length here click on the box and then i'm going to type in asterisk which is multiply by 1080 which is the horizontal resolution and then i'm going to divide by the vertical which is 1920 and so we're basically multiplying the focal length by the aspect ratio of the image and what that will do is it will correct the focal length so that we get something a little bit more reasonable. And now you see that when we scrub through, the image is actually matching to that grid on the floor. It's actually sticking to it much more nicely, which means that we're probably using the correct focal length. And in this case as well, you can see that the camera is pointing down at the ground. What I'm going to do is I'm going to press R and then X and then X again. And I'm just going to move the horizon of the camera up to the horizon. And then I'm going to press R on its own. And I'm just going to rotate the horizon so that it lines up with what we can see in the distance there. And so that will now give us something that's a little bit more like a camera tracking the real world scene. You can see that there are still some wobbles, occasional bits where it deviates from the tracking there. You can see that wobble there, a little flick in the... And, what, and so you might want to go in here and adjust some of the tracking features. Again, it looks like it might be this one that's the culprit because that seems to have deviated a lot from the original pixels that it was tracking. And, and you can go in and, and solve the camera motion. One thing to be aware of is that if you do that, you might want to copy the focal length beforehand because when you press solve camera motion, it will reset the focal length again. So I'm just going to reset that and then I'm going to paste the old focal length back in there. So does that help a little bit? Yeah, that, that I think that's helped a little bit. With, there's still a little bit of a wobble, but we could still go back in and refine those tracking points even more if we wanted to. I think it probably is also due to this one as well, which is probably contributing to it a little bit. Yeah, it looks like that there should be more like there and then there. It should be more like there and then there. It should be more like there and so on. And then let's try solving that again. Yeah, that's kind of brought the peak down a little bit. So this is how we do the tracking stage. So now next, let's look at how we can project this onto a sphere and create a panorama. So I'm going to go over here to layout. I'm going to change the viewport shading to material preview. And I'm going to delete my cube, my plane, my light. I'm going to select my camera. I'm going to press shift S and then I'm going to move it to the center of the scene using selection to cursor and I'm going to move it up a little bit as well because this camera person was a little bit above the ground and what we're going to do is we're going to put a sphere around the camera and then we're going to project onto that sphere so first of all I'm going to press shift s put the cursor to where the camera is and then I'm going to press shift a and I'm going to add a mesh uv sphere I'm going to scale that up a bit in edit mode so I'm going to scale up to about let's say five times and I'm also going to delete half of it so we can see the camera on the inside I'm going to go over here to my top view I'm going to turn on x-ray and I'm going to select half of these verts delete them and so you can see that our camera is now looking at the inside of a hemisphere I'm also going to go over here to the modifiers tab I'm going to add a a subdivision surface modifier and that's going to make the sphere a little bit smoother. I'm going to set the viewport levels to 2 and I'm going to right click and then shade to smooth so we've got a nice sphere that we're projecting into. 
And I'm going to go here and look at where my camera is moving in relation to the sphere. So it's kind of in that direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the camera slightly so that it's projecting into the middle of the sphere. Yep, that's pretty good. Maybe a little bit further around. And then I'm going to select the sphere and I'm going to go over to my shading tab. And this is going to add the material that's projected by the camera. So here in the shading tab, I'm going to add a new material. And this is the default setup with the principal BSEF. But we want to add a texture node. So I'm going to go to texture and I'm going to go to image texture. And in the image texture, I'm going to load up the footage that we used to do the motion tracking in the first place, which is this video from Gaza. And by default, it's going to only use one frame. So I'm going to press N to bring up my properties here on the side. And under properties, I'm going to press this little button here. So that will automatically set the number of frames for the video. And I'm also going to press this button here, auto refresh. And that's going to make sure that the video is continuously updating in the viewport. It's going to connect the color from the output of the texture node into the base color of the principal BSDF. And you can see that we get the texture kind of very distorted spread around that sphere. So in order to make this project as if it was coming from the camera, what we need to do is we need to add a UV project modifier to the sphere. So I'm going to click on the sphere, go to the modifiers tab and add a UV project modifier. I'm going to select the camera as the projector. And I also need to set the aspect ratio here the same as my image texture. So in the image texture, with it selected and with the properties panel open here, you can see that the resolution is 720 by 1280. It's going to put that as the resolution, 720 by 1280. So now you can see that it is projecting with the correct aspect ratio, but the image is repeated infinitely towards the edges of this object. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the setting here, repeat to clip. And now we've just got the bit that we're concerned with, but we've also got this black outline and we can avoid that by going to add a transparent shader. If we go to shader here and then add a transparent shader, we get this. And then we're going to also add a mix shader. And we're going to plug the transparent into one socket, principled into the other, and then we're going to put the output of the mix shader into the surface. To begin with, that will just fade the two. But if we take the alpha, alpha output from the texture, put that into the factor. And then if we go to the options and set the blend mode to alpha blend, you can see that we just have the image being projected. And now if we play the video, you can see that we have the stabilized video playing projected onto the sphere. One thing we might want to do is set the roughness value to the maximum and that will allow us to see the image texture a bit more clearly. You can see when the roughness is set low, we get this kind of shiny. You might also want to substitute this principle for an emission shader. So here you'd use the emission shader instead and that would ensure that the pixels that we were seeing had the maximum brightness and we could also crank the brightness up even higher to get more detail from the image. I'm going to set the frame range to 350 for now so that we can see the section that we've tracked. And so that was the duration of the video that we tracked. But if we were to continue this process, we could track the whole footage. So what's really nice about this is that we have a stabilized piece of footage that allows us to put fixed reference points into 3D space. So if I wanted to sort of keep tab of the location of this red cloud cloud that we can see here, I could put the 3D cursor here. And as I move the timeline through, you can see that that 3D cursor remains in the same place. And we can see later on in the footage, that same location when the red has disappeared. So it's really good for keeping track of points. And it's also good for geospatial modeling, because we can, for example, identify the location of this building. And if we draw a line from the camera out into that building, and then out into the wider three dimensional space, we can understand how this camera sits in relation to the other objects.